Kay, and welcome to the Women's Health Talk for Nursing 601 at the University of Southern Maine. Uh, you're welcome to listen to it, even if you're not in this class. This uh, talk talks about a number of different things, including uh, birth control, hormone replacement. Um, it is a supplement to the Men's Health Talk, uh, in which I've also talked about some urologic issues, including overactive bladder, um, which are also women's health issues. So. Um, it is um, something that uh, you may uh, go back and look at that one as well. The uh, next slide, I do have the um, address of my uh, YouTube channel. Um, you're welcome to go and listen to any of those. Nursing 601 has a number of different uh, talks on it, some original, some not. Um, but basically, it just covers a whole bunch of things that I think are useful for uh, pharmacology. Contraceptive options, a whole bunch of different options. Uh, we say there's no exactly preferred method, meaning that uh, you'll tailor the method to the individual. Uh, a number of different uh, methods have different levels of success, however, and uh, obviously that's going to factor into your decision. Um, other pros and cons will also be factored. Uh, it's definitely not easy for, for many people to choose a type of contraception just because there are uh, disadvantages to any type, so um, patients need to get educated, we need to be educated, we need to definitely be able to explain the options available, um, and, and also make sure that people have realistic expectations. They need to understand that there is a failure rate for all birth control methods, even though with a number of methods it's very low, um, but that um, you know they do need to be aware of that. Um, also, they need to understand that birth control methods in general don't really provide much, if any, protection against sexually transmitted diseases. Um, some will change. Uh, pH will change the environment such that there is a slightly uh, decreased risk. Um, but in general, we need them to understand that um, contraception is uh, um, a different thing than uh, STI prevention. So uh, contraceptive options. Uh, so how will we help people choose a method? Well, obviously, if they're in um, good health, uh, as most people are, uh, it gives us a lot of different options. If their health is poor, um, there are certain contraindications, um, including heart disease with some of them and uh, various others. The um, USMLE uh, review of contraception that I've posted uh, in this uh, playlist also does review this and maybe talks about the, um, the health implications a little bit more. Uh, age is an issue. Um, oral contraceptives are, are really predominantly used in people under 35, although um, we also can use them in people over 35. And the uh, USMEC um, is a great resource for really looking at the advantages and disadvantages uh, so I would highly encourage you to familiarize yourself with the USMEC uh, in regards to uh, some of those things. Uh, obviously, if someone doesn't want children in the future, um, permanent methods or sterilization is going to be an option, uh, as well as choosing a, a method um, that's a long-acting method uh, that might factor into when they might, might want to have children, three years, five years, et cetera, et cetera. If they have a number of sexual partners, um, they need to understand that the barrier methods uh, also do prevent um, sexually transmitted infections. Uh, on the other hand, uh, um, you know, they're not as effective in general. Um, we need to uh, make sure that we understand as well as the patient understands how each method prevents pregnancy, uh, as well as understanding the uh, side effects of each method. So um, the methods we're going to talk about today include uh, abstinence, natural rhythm, barrier methods, hormonal contraceptives, uh, um, contraceptives that uh, interfere with implantation, uh, as well as um, sterilization, uh, and also some uh, mention toward the end of uh, emergency contraception. Abstinence. Well, uh, we hear lots and lots about abstinence. Uh, over the years, there's been an, a lot of advocation for abstinence-only programs. Uh, they suggest never having sex, um, which theoretically will prevent pregnancy and prevent sexually transmitted diseases. However, when we really look at whether or not it works or not, um, the uh, NIH actually did contract with a company called Mathematica 
uh, to really evaluate whether or not abstinence-only methods were effective. Uh, and unfortunately, they found that they really did not have a lot of support for any of these abstinence-only approaches. Um, uh, age of um, in sexual initiation was roughly similar. Um, STI rates were roughly similar. Uh, and in fact, uh, sometimes they even found uh, um, slightly higher rates of um, STIs uh, in these folks. So in general, uh, abstinence is not going to be uh, a method that has a lot of evidence for it, although there's um, clearly folks that still will advocate for it. The rhythm method, uh, which has been used for a uh, number of years, um, says that uh, um, people that are trying not to get pregnant <coughs> can um, avoid sex during the uh, period uh, near ovulation. Um, for it to be effective, um, one must avoid uh, sex for five days before and three or four days after ovulation. Um, women will uh, keep a written journal of uh, when the period is, uh, types of flow, body temperature. Uh, there's even uh, some um, folks that will actually try to look at cervical mucus and uh, try to figure out uh, the character of the cervical mucus. In general, this method is 80 to 87 percent effective, um, which is not spectacular, but uh, uh, folks that have uh, religious objections to artificial contraception, um, including folks that were uh, Catholic for a number of years, did use this, um, this method. <coughs> so the um, Next methods that we'll look at are the barrier methods, and um, a number of these um, are are pretty well known to patients. They are available over the counter. Uh, there are some that um, are less commonly used, and that's the ones I'm predominantly going to talk about. Um, the contraceptive sponge is um, not that readily available, although you can find it on Amazon. It's about thirty-six dollars for. Uh, three sponges at this point. It's basically the equivalent of a diaphragm, uh, except that it's disposable. Um, it contains nonoxonal 9, which kills the sperm, um, and uh, is moderately effective. Um, any of these um, methods probably have a 8 or 10 percent failure rate, so pretty substantial. Um, that also includes the uh, cervical cap, um, which was very popular. Um, years ago before we started using more IUDs and long-acting um, reversible contraception, um, add spermicide. Um, there are women that still want to use these kinds of methods. Um, if you end up doing a lot of women's health, you'll probably need to get some training and some experience on how to um, uh, insert them. For the majority of us, though, uh, we're not going to be doing a, a whole lot of, um, of these kinds of uh, methods. Uh, condoms, um, pretty much everybody in the world understands how condoms work. Um, best work uh, if you use a spermicide with them, um, and they do have some as far as preventing STIs. Um, hormonal methods, probably the most common hormonal method is the estrogen progesterone pill um, or the patch or the ring. Um, we often will abbreviate this as uh, CHC for combined hormonal contraception. Um, it's also sometimes called COC for combined oral contraception. Um, these pills basically just suppress ovulation. Um, there's a number of different um, videos on YouTube that you can watch if you're really interested in the um, in the physiology of exactly how that works. Um, but um, basically, they alter the endometrial lining. They keep the sperm from getting up into the upper genital tract uh, through uh, changing the environment with pH and various others um, such that it makes it a, a, a bit more hostile. Uh, they come in a number of different uh, preparations. Um, the majority are, um, are you know, 20, 21 day um, with seven days of uh, placebo. Um, there are a number of newer preparations such as seasonal. Um, which are basically a 90-day um, oral contraceptive in which the uh, woman takes the pills for um, 83 days and then has a placebo for seven days um, such that she basically only menstruates uh, four times a year. Um, this is pretty appealing, obviously, to a lot of um, women. <coughs> but
but um, um, you know there are, are various preparations available. Um, side effects for the estrogen, progesterone, uh, pills, nausea, bloating, breast tenderness, uh, abnormal bleeding. Um, depending on the type of the estrogen and the type of the progesterone, uh, there's varying levels of abnormal bleeding. Um, and uh, we'll talk in a minute about uh, how one might adjust that. Uh, weight can fluctuate. Um, a lot of women will retain fluid with these oral contraceptives. Um, and side effects uh, may be related to that. Uh, headaches and migraines might also be related to that, but uh, a number of women do get headaches or migraines. Again, a uh, classic migraine or a migraine with aura is probably a, a contraindication to using these kinds of um, oral contraceptives. Uh, depression, change of mood is a not infrequent side effect uh, of, this, of these medications, and so you do need to um, keep that in mind. Uh, patch specific, obviously, um, you can get an inflammation at the site. Um, there is also some concern that the patches, because they don't have first pass metabolism um, and because of, um, you know, sort of the different absorption, uh, may actually have greater side effects, including uh, venous thromboembolism and other side effects associated with it. So um, just be aware that patients may ask you about that. Uh, I'm not really sort of convinced that that's the case, but that, that has been speculated. Uh, and obviously the vaginal ring, uh, women can get irritation. Uh, one of the other issues with the vaginal ring is some women do find it problematic to have it in during uh, intercourse. Um, in that case, they can actually remove it uh, during intercourse, but it has to be uh, replaced within a few hours um, after doing that. I think three hours is the, is the limit. Um, Definitely uh, women that uh, take oral contraceptive pills um, should not be smoking, um, but especially if there's a woman who is 35 and older who is smoking, you probably shouldn't have her on an oral contraceptive. Women with um, uh, history of blood clots, history of breast liver or endometrial cancer, or even really any liver tumor of any kind, even if it was a benign tumor, uh, that's a relative uh, uh, or in many cases, um, absolute contraindication for, um, for this kind of a medication. Combined hor uh, hormonal contraceptives, uh, again, we choose those based on the estrogenic effect, the progestin effect, and the androgenic effect. The androgenic effect is based on the type of progestin. Um, each one of the progestins uh, has a different potency, um, and so the... Um, the uh, pill will be chosen based on the side effects or the objective of what you're trying to do. Um, when we look at the progestins, uh, we can see that uh, drospirinone is a bit different chemically. Uh, drospirinone is the uh, progestin that's in Yaz and um, a few other uh, oral contraceptives. Um, so it does have kind of a different effect. Um, the norgestimate is a common one. Um, the nor norethandrone is a common one, so um, there are a number of common ones um, in that uh, middle category that you see there um, in the usual oral contraceptives. Um, the ones over on the left, um, the C21 progestins, um, include the depo-medroxyprogestone acetate, abbreviated DMPA, um, which are the uh, implantable or uh, injectable um, progesterones. Um, it isn't particularly important for oral contraceptives to understand that there's three types of estrogens, um, but it is more important when we're looking at um, supplements in regards to postmenopausal supplements. Um, almost all, um, and I think actually all, uh, oral contraceptives have E2, the estradiol. Um, so that is the important one to know about. We can actually supplement the other types of estrogen, uh, especially if we use a compounded estrogen um, later on in life um, with a compounded um, cream. Um, but uh, just so that you're aware at this point that there are various types of um, estrogen uh, and to keep that in mind. So one of the big questions for folks is, where do I start with oral contraceptives? And um, for many of us, it actually comes down to just choosing a quick and easy single contraceptive um, that 
uh, is effective, can get people started, um, and then we can actually go back and we can adjust um, the uh, oral contraceptive based on the side effects. Um, in regards to prescribing contraceptive pills, um, uh, Dr. Dickey, D-I-C-K-E-Y, uh, is well known, has written a number of different books, and, and women's health practitioners um, really do depend on Dr. Dickey's book um, to really become experts in um, choosing an oral contraceptive which has the right balance of estrogenic, progesterone, as well as androgenic effects. Um, I usually start with a medicine called Sprintec, uh, which is 0 0.25 milligrams of norgestimate and uh, uh, 35 micrograms of ethanol estradiol. It's a monophasic um, oral contraceptive. Um, there are monophasics, biphasics, and triphasics. Uh, there really is not any evidence that says that one is that much better than the other as far as preventing pregnancy. Um, some women do have a preference for the various types, um, you know, based on side effects and lifestyle. Um, but uh, again, if you start out with a monophasic, um, you are going to uh, achieve your basic objective, which is um, prevention of pregnancy. Um, and again, I'll leave the um, uh, more sophisticated uh, um, biophasics and triphasics. I actually leave those to the folks that do a lot of, um, of women's health. Um, the reference progestin is uh, nor norethandrone. Um, norethandrone has um, what we consider to be a one effect as far as progestin and a one effect as far as androgen. Um, all of the um, progestins are then uh, rated. You can easily find um, rating charts online um, that really do compare how that um, estrogen, I'm sorry, that progesterone uh, does compare to, um, to the norethandrone. So norgestimate has 1.3 times the progestational and 1.9 the androgenic effect. So it's going to be a little bit more likely to um, cause acne. Uh, on the other hand, uh, androgenic effect tends to also um, increase sex drive. So if you had somebody that was complaining of a, a relatively low sex drive, you would want to use a um, higher anti, uh, I'm sorry, a higher androgenic effect. So um, as I say, a number of you are probably already more sophisticated in prescribing these than I am at this point. Uh, and any of you that end up doing a lot of uh, women's health will become progressively more sophisticated. So uh, as we mentioned, the types of uh, estrogen might be important for complex questions. Um, other hormonal methods for uh, contraception. Um, there is also um, a progestin-only pill, um, and the um, effect of that is that it, um, you know, thickens cervical mucus, uh, suppresses ovulation, thins the endometrial uh, lining. The complicated element about the progestin-only pills is that they um, have a much higher failure rate. Um, and they have a higher failure, failure rate because um, they're very sensitive to the woman taking the pill every single day at almost exactly the same time. So um, these are pretty well going to be reser reserved for specific populations, women that are breastfeeding. This is actually a pretty good uh, con uh, contraception for them uh, just because uh, it does not seem to have um, issues um, with breastfeeding. Uh, another group that this might be an option for is women that have had any sort of um, venous throm thromboembolic event. Uh, um, maybe not quite as good as uh, uh, some of the other uh, methods, um, but definitely better than anything that had um, estrogen in it as far as that. So um, I have seen it used. Um, effects of these progestin only. Um, uh, include some side effects. Um, these women tend to have a lot of spotting. They have a lot of unscheduled bleeding. They don't seem to have regular periods as well. Um, that can be distressing to them just because they know that the failure rate um, as far as pregnancy is much higher. And so if they have these irregular bleeding periods or uh, go a little while longer, um, it can be concerning to them. So as I say, um, not a great choice for a lot of women, um, just because the practicalities of it all. Um, they can also develop a certain type of ovarian cyst. 
Um, and so if you have women that have um, belly pain, uh, you'll need to ultrasound them and see if they have a cyst, um, as well as do follow-up um, ultrasounds to make sure that those cysts do resolve. Um, progestin, uh, depending on the antigenic effect, uh, also can flare up acne. They can be associated with nausea. They can be associated with headaches. Um, breast tenderness is also a common side effect. All right. <coughs> so um, there are also injectable versions of the um, progestins. The Defo Provera um, is... Uh, available, um, does the same thing basically as the progestin pill, except that it um, don't it, uh, it absorbs gradually over time, so you don't have to worry about the woman missing the pill. Um, changes the cervix. Um, it's injected into the buttock or arm every three months. Um, women can be taught to do this themselves uh, or a family member, uh, although m most women do come into the clinic every three months just because it's not a bad idea to kind of check their weight, check in, see if they're getting side effects, um, because increased weight is a pretty common side effect. In general, we don't use these for long periods of time because there is a decreased bone density associated with it. Uh, there are women that do sort of insist on continuing it longer. Uh, in those cases, sometimes we end up doing um, a bone density testing. Um, most of these women are without a period for the period of time that they're on. Uh, hormonal contraception um, for, you know, the DMPA. Um, but at any rate, they are effective uh, contraceptions, uh, contraceptive method um, without um, much for side effects. So um, they're a good choice for a lot of women. Um, other methods in regards to uh, implantation, um, Basically, um, there's a medicine um, that says Implanon on the slide, but in fact, the majority of folks will use what they call Nexplanon. Uh, Nexplanon is a um, small matchstick-sized rod. It's placed under the skin in the upper arm, and it basically re releases progestin over time, um, just like the um, um, DMPA does, except that it's a, a matter of years rather than a matter of months. Um, you would need to obviously check the, the type and the brand, but um, last I looked, I believe it was three years that they were good for, um, but um, there may be some others that are, are good for even longer. Um, the copper IUD um, uh, is Paragard. It's actually misspelled on the slide, so I apologize for that. Um, it's basically uh, the equivalent of the copper T. Um, we used to use the copper 7, which was something slightly different, but basically this is the copper T, I'll show you a picture in a minute. Um, it releases a small amount of copper into the uterus. uterus. It um, uh, makes a hostile environment for the sperm. Um, and basically it also, um, if fertilization did occur, uh, would prevent the fertilized egg from implanting. Uh, some women have a hard time with this um, based on religion, just because they believe that um, life begins at conception. Uh, and so those women probably um, would want to use an IUD that um, um, prevented um, conception uh, more effectively, such as the Mirena or the Skyler or one of the hormonal-based ones. Um, speaking of the hormonal-based ones, um, three currently are available, the Mirena, um, the Skyla, and the Loletta. The Mirena is a 52-milligram um, IUD. Um, it... Um, um, absorbs over a period of five years. Um, my experience has been that at about four and a half years, women start to have um, some breakthrough and a little bit more for periods, um, although not every woman and probably might even be able to go longer than that. Some evidence seems to say maybe it could go six years. Um, the Loletta is basically the exact same thing. Currently, it's approved for three years just because when it went to the FDA, that's all they had for data was three years worth of data. Um, but basically, it's the exact same medicine as the Mirena, and I suspect that that will be um, increased uh, to five years um, uh, over the next few years. And uh, Skylar is actually a substantially lower um, dose of the uh, levonorgestrel. Um, in fact, because of that, um, it has less side effects, but it also has less uh, likelihood of causing amenorrhea. Uh, the Mirena and the Loletta, when you insert them, really 
in the vast majority of patients after uh, several months of irregular spotting and you know some uh, other issues at about four or five months in, they usually become amenorrheic and stay that way for the next uh, four plus years. So uh, most of those women do uh, very well with that. The Schuyler is actually very slightly smaller. Um, it's about a millimeter uh, less wide and a millimeter long, less long. Um, some women, maybe that makes a difference. It's being marketed as a uh, better option for melliparous women, uh, women that haven't had a baby yet, um, just because it might go through the cervix a little bit easier. But um, there are methodologies that you can use to soften the cervix up a little bit. Uh, I did uh, also post on the um, playlist um, the uh, Mirainer insertion uh, video, um, and that reviews all that. Um, the Mirena and the Loletta and the Schuyler release the progestin into the uterus, um, thicken the cervical mucus, do all the same things that DMPA does. So, um, One of the big things that I've seen, uh, not that over the several past several years, is that um, especially if you put them into adolescence, the uh, expulsion rate can be pretty high. Estimates are anywhere from 5 to 22 percent with adolescence. Um, and if they're going to expel it, they're going to do it in the first month or two. Um, and overall, it's about 3 to 5 percent for all IUD users. Um, can be an issue because these things can get pretty darned expensive. So um, obviously, we want to warn people ahead of time uh, that this is a possibility. All righty. All right, so here's the, um, uh, the Paragard, uh, which is the copper IUD on the left, uh, the Mirena, uh, and the Schuyler, you know, right here. You can see there's the Schuyler. It is slightly smaller, but um, to the naked eye, unless you're holding them right next to each other, you're not going to see that much difference. Um, a form of permanent birth control, which seems to be... Um, gaining favor is the Assure, um, which is basically a spring-like device that's placed up into the fallopian tubes during hysteroscopy. Um, basically, it car causes scar tissue to form around the spring, and that blocks the fallopian tubes. Um, it's an office-based procedure, doesn't require anesthesia, um, so it's actually a nice option for a lot of women that would rather not uh, have to have... Um, um, a major uh, procedure, go in the hospital or do outpatient, uh, have anesthesia. It really is probably um, even, you know, equivalent to the vasectomy as far as the amount of invasiveness and everything. Uh, just to show you the picture here, um, that's the, uh, the, um, the Assure right there in that fallopian tube. You can see... Uh, and basically, it's placed using a hysteroscope. Um, it's placed up into the uh, fallopian tubes uh, and creates a uh, permanent uh, sterilization. Um, plan B, next choice, um, emergency contraception. Uh, again, contraception. I apologize for the misspelling. Um, is um, used when a woman has uh, unprotected sex and there was no birth control used. Could be used in methods of rape, could be um, related to alcohol-related sex, uh, impulse, whatever. Obviously, when I talk to especially teens about emergency contraception, I emphasize that it is not as effective as regular contraception. So it is not to be used as a... Um, replacement for regular contraception, but it's definitely better than nothing. So, uh, stops the ovaries from releasing the egg, keeps the sperm from joining with the egg. Um, for best effect, it should be taken within 72 hours after having unprotected sex. Um, the exception to that is the uh, insertion of a uh, Paragard, which actually can be done up to seven days um, afterwards. Um, it is available at the pharmacy counter for women 17 years and older who have a valid ID. Um, uh, I believe that's actually the current Maine law is uh, 17 years. Um, the age of consent for sex in Maine is uh, 16. Um, I believe it actually doesn't have to be a woman. It can actually be a man as well that um, gets the, uh, the medicine. So um, 
the valid ID, they don't actually take uh, down a list of who gets it. Uh, they just basically want to make sure that the, um, the folks that are using this medicine are uh, at the age of consent. Um, so it's kind of like showing your ID to um, buy alcohol. Uh, there's no permanent record that, that you could did that other than probably the camera in the pharmacy. Um, but um, they do want to make sure that they're not s uh, severely young people. A uh, number of different options for um, post-coital um, uh, contraception or emergency contraception. Uh, Plan B is probably the most common one. This is the one that uh, people know the most. Um, Plan B one step is, is probably the, uh, the one that uh, most people have used. Um, but there are uh, several different choices available. Uh, they are available um, over the counter. You do not need a um, prescription to get them. Um, although, um, again, some pharmacies are still kind of keeping them behind the counter uh, just to make sure that the uh, ID law is followed. But um, it is actually, and you can see that the Plan B one step uh, is approved for 16, or actually, I'm sorry, prescription 16 and younger, over the counter 17 and older. So. Hormone replacement therapy, um, women, um, as they get older, uh, sometimes will have a lot of um, uh, menopause-related uh, uh, symptoms. And so um, these kinds of symptoms, including the what is called either hot flushes or hot flashes, um, can occur. Uh, and also these women can have uh, issues with vaginal dryness, um, increased uh, risk of infections, um, some mood changes, um, weight changes, insomnia is actually a pretty common complaint that these women have. Um, the um, use of hormone therapy is predominantly for women between 45 and 55. Average age of menopause is 52. Um, and so, um, unfortunately, that can range 10 years in either direction. Uh, so that means women as young as 42 might have menopause, but it also means that a woman might, ha might not have menopause until she's in her early 60s. Um, best predictor of that is usually when your mother had menopause, although a number of different factors, including weight, um, whether one smokes, those kinds of things um, can also in impact menopause. So. Um, it's a bit hard to predict. Um, medications that we use to relieve um, menopause symptoms um, are hormonal, uh, but also some non-hormonal. Uh, and we'll talk about both of those. Um, hormonal are probably the most common. So basically, um, the gold standard for menopause relief is estrogen. Um, Usually the E2s, um, but also the E1s and the E3s might be um, useful in some women. Um, to be honest with you, um, I don't do a ho whole lot of um, menopausal type uh, hormone replacement therapy, um, but the uh, folks that do a lot of um, GYN obviously do become uh, way more proficient in this. Um, you, you probably will not use um, hormone therapy in a woman that has a history of breast cancer. Um, that um, issue with the breast cancer, of course, is going to depend whether it's an estrogen dependent or a non-estrogen dependent. There might be a woman uh, that is an appropriate candidate for this that had a non-estrogen dependent uh, tumor. Um, but the majority of women that have breast cancer, not only are you not putting them on estrogens, you're actually putting them on anti-estrogens, things like tamoxifen, um, which actually sort of, you know, try to block the estrogenic effect. Um, strokes, um, coronary heart disease, those kinds of things obviously are, are relative contraindication for, um, you know, using any sort of hormonal therapy. So uh, one would want to do that very carefully. Adverse event is very low in healthy women. Um, some of these women do get substantially in better um, quality of life. So, you know, just kind of keep that in mind. Um, if you have a woman and you put her on estro estrogen, you do need to be very aware that there is an increased risk of endometrial cancer. So if you do start her on an estrogen, uh, you do need to oppose that estrogen with a progestin. Um, there's two ways to do that. One is to cycle it just like you would with an oral contraceptive. 
Um, the other way to do that is to have the woman on both the estrogen and the progestin at the same time. Uh, there's advantages and disadvantages to each of those approaches, and you know, I would encourage you to uh, um, you know, investigate that before you do prescribe these. Um, if a woman has had a hysterectomy, we don't have to worry about endometrial cancer, of course, so that you can give her an unopposed um, estrogen. Um, so um, if you do start women on estrogen uh, for menopausal um, symptoms, uh, you're going to want to make sure that that woman has, you know, fairly life-impacting symptoms, moderate to severe symptoms, uh, and try her on relatively low-dose short-term therapy for two or three years. Um, generally, we don't go above five years. Um, you know, we do will see some women that absolutely insist on staying on it. We try to take them off, and they get a lot of symptoms. Um, but obviously, you'd want to do um, documentation of informed consent and, and really be careful with doing that. Uh, systemic estrogen is administered orally or transdermally. There are patches to do it transdermally. Um, there's also a patch that includes um, some um, testosterone. Uh, and uh, the theory there is that um, uh, women that um, um, are menopausal may have other isu issues, including decreased sex drive that testosterone may help with. Um, the uh, compounding pharmacies um, can also compound E1, E2, E3, different combinations thereof, and or put some testosterone in that as well. Um, the uh, estrogens do seem to preserve bone density. Um, they treat the menopause. Um, there's a number of different uh, uh, preparations available, uh, Premarin, Pento, Vivac. Um, and uh, I won't talk specifically about those but they're basically just an estrogen preparation. Um, Premarin is called that because it is uh, derived from the um, uh, urine of pregnant mares. Um, so obviously a number of people are not thrilled with that as the um, origin of the medicine. Um, there is a great deal of interest in bioidentical hormones. There's not a whole lot of evidence that they work any better as far as the symptoms, but some folks feel that they are um, more similar, and there's certain preparations that are um, considered bioidentical. Obviously, the Premarin, since it's from a horse, that estrogen is not going to be bioidentical to human estrogen, uh, so that would not be one that would be bioidentical. So um, side effects, weight change, belly pain, a little bit of nausea, headaches, migraines, all the same things that are treated there in that study too. Uh, vaginal uh, estrogen for vaginoscopy, uh, what we used to call atrophic vaginitis, uh, is now just called vaginopathy. Um, and so um, a lot of women will come in with um, either um, sexually related issues with um, dyspareunia, with uh, pain with um, sexual activity, um, and they'll uh, ask for a preparation that will help with that. Um, the other thing that you'll see is a lot of these women tend to have enough irritation around the urethra that they feel like they have a urinary tract infection. And so whenever you have a woman that's in her early 50s, especially if she's, you know, recently or, you know, a bit postmenopausal, um, once you dip her urine, if you've got, you know, lots of evidence that she does not have a urinary tract infection, uh, this type of vaginal atrophy uh, symptom can actually um, present as that. Um, so there's a number of different preparations, most of them topical, um, to um, give these women uh, that will um, uh, decrease the um, vaginal atrophy, the dryness of the vaginal mucosa. Um, you know, you can get some irritation from those. You can get some, you know, stomach cramps, that kind of thing. But in general, they really don't have much of a side effect. Alrighty, progestin preparations. Uh, as we noted, in women that have not had a hysterectomy, you really do need to use some kind of a progestin preparation. Um, the uh, common ones, of course, are going to be the Tormetrium or the Medroxyprogesterone. Don't forget that if you have a woman that has Mirena, uh, that basically has a progestin in it, so that that should provide the uh, opposition to the estrogen um, so that you don't need to um, uh, oppose it. Um, the Mirena also, of course, will cause um, 
uh, amenorrhea around the women that are perimenopausal, uh, and it can actually be really helpful because a lot of those women, as they're perimenopausal, will start to develop um, menorrhagia, which is excess um, flow, higher, you know, heavier periods. Um, and they'll um, experience metrorrhagia, which is irregular periods. So the, the most severe thing is, you know, some of these women will get menometrorrhagia, um, in which they're basically having a heavy period every two or three weeks. Um, those women are not terribly thrilled about that. Um, options for treatment there include uh, Mirena. Um, they could do an ablation. Um, and some of those women actually end up um, with a hysterectomy, although, you know, that's not as common because we at least have the treatment for that now. The dosing for the medroxyprogesterone, if you're cycling the woman, is 5 to 10 milligrams per day for the portion of the monthly cycle. So you might do Premarin for 21 days and then do um, medroxyprogesterone, Provera is the other name, for uh, 6 or 7 days, and then go back to the... Um, um, to the uh, estrogen. Uh, the other option is to basically just keep the woman on 2.5 milligrams of Provera um, throughout, um, throughout, you know, the entire month. Uh, side effects, same as, as they are pretty much with everything else, weight gain, belly pain, headache, amenorrhea, menstrual spotting. Uh, they do decrease the bone density, um, preferred not to use them for more than two years or so. Um, and so, um, Basically, uh, you know, you'd want to get bone densities, and if there was uh, decrease in bone density, obviously you'd want to get this uh, this woman on it. For the Prometrium, the dosage is 200 milligrams a day if you're going to cycle it, or 100 milligrams a day if you're going to keep her on it all the time. Side effects are pretty. Um, Mirena is actually an off-label use um, for the premenopausal woman. Um, but uh, it does seem to be uh, as good or better than, um, you know, using uh, the systemic um, progesterones. Uh, we don't have a lot of research right now on the use of the Mirena in that group, though, but it is being used pretty commonly. Um, other mes uh, menopausal treatments that are non-hormonal, um, you can opt for some of these uh, other non-hormonal treatments, um, including um, some medicines in the antidepressant family, uh, as well as the clonidine or the gabapent. The antidepressants that you can use, fluoxetine, uh, which is um, uh, good old-fashioned Prozac, uh, the venlafaxine, which is an SNRI, uh, formerly known or also known as Effexor, and the escitalopram. Uh, escitalopram probably would work as well, but the escitalopram seems to be getting more favor because it doesn't have the um, uh, precursors. It just has the uh, effective um, agent. Uh, the only issue with the escitalopram is sometimes it is more expensive than the escitalopram, but uh, over time as we um, develop more and more generics for those kinds of things, I suspect that uh, that effect will go away. Um, the escitalopram is actually still on the Walmart $4 list, whereas the escitalopram clearly is not. The fluoxetine just fell off the Walmart $4 list. They had been on for years and years and years. Uh, and it was just recently taken off. So it really just leaves you two uh, SSRIs on that list right now, the citalopram and the um, Paxil. Uh, I'm not a big fan of Paxil just because the um, taking somebody off uh, Paxil, they have a lot of withdrawal, and it can be a very difficult um, experience. So um, most of the uh, effects of these um, antidepressants show mild or moderate benefits uh, when compared to placebo maybe not quite as much as some of the hormonal um, medicines, but definitely without the side effects of the hormones. Uh, they have their own set of side effects, of course, with the nausea, the weight loss, decreased appetite, dry mouth, insomnia, headache, those kinds of things. Clonidine um, is a uh, centrally acting alpha agonist, uh, has a lot of different effects. Uh, some women do seem to ben uh, benefit uh, with menopausal symptoms from it. Uh, oral uh, tablet, start out at a low dose, 0.1 milligrams. Uh, you can actually go as high as 0.4 milligrams, although remember it's also an uh, antihypertensive, so uh, that woman is likely to have a substantial decrease in her uh, blood pressure if you get uh, to any kind of a dose. Uh, there is a 0.1 milligram per day patch um, that's replaced once a, a week, the Catapress um, patch, um, but um, 
it might not work quite as effectively. Um, decreases that sympathetic outflow, especially the uh, alpha effect. Um, you know, lowers the heart rate a little bit, lowers the blood pressure. Uh, side effects include dry mouth, uh, dizziness, sedation, headache, um, contact dermatitis uh, with the patch. Uh, and in general, uh, my experience has been that people um, either tolerate clonidine great or don't tolerate it at all. A lot of people just don't feel good on it. So um, it's something that you could think about doing, but I would do a refill with hesitance and caution. Uh, another treatment is the gabapentin, uh, which is an anticonvulsant that we found all sorts of different effects for, including pain control and others. Uh, does seem to have um, a theoretic benefit, although um, we don't really have a whole lot of data that suggests that it's helpful. Um, so I would be very cautious and use this one only with, um, um, you know, only if nothing else is working. Um, Dosing is the usual, 300 to 900. Usually we start somebody off on 100 uh, for a day or two and then go to 200 for a day or two and then 300 for a day or two. And then you can actually go to, uh, um, you know, pretty uh, quick uh, increase uh, up to 300 two times a day. Um, you could also just do 300 to 600 at bedtime, especially if most of their symptoms were at bedtime. Uh, side effects are dizziness, peripheral edema, nausea, vomiting. Uh, didn't uh, really make a slide up on it, but uh, there are a number of different herbal therapies that are used for menopause, including Eden and Primrose, Rose Oil, and others. Um, the uh, research um, benefits are uh, relatively uh, limited, but um, you know there are people that absolutely swear by it, and if it works, um, you know it's one of those things that isn't going to have a whole lot of side effects, but. I'll investigate that further and, and hopefully update this talk in a year or two and, and have more information on that. Um, if there's any questions, feel free to um, uh, talk, uh, talk to me in class, email me, or uh, if you're looking at this mostly on Blackboard, feel free to post any questions. Um, uh, and when I say Blackboard, I mean YouTube. Uh, feel free to uh, post any questions uh, on YouTube. Um, I'll try to keep in, in looking at it and respond to uh, any questions that there might be. A uh, few references, obviously a lot of this information is sort of general knowledge, so it's uh, available anywhere. Um, so I um, uh, hope you uh, enjoyed this talk, and um, we will conclude this talk now, and uh, thanks for listening. <laughs>